Okay, everybody out there in uh, YouTube land, uh, it is I, Matt Yancic, uh, founder and head game master here at Manufactured Myth and Ledger Domain. And I also happen to be the host for tonight's big show, Role Player with a Thousand Faces. So as, uh, as most of you know, every few weeks, I like to bring you someone super interesting from out there in the RPG hobby, in the RPG community, in the RPG world. Um, and with each and every episode, I like to sort of explore and try uh, take a look at different aspects of the game um, and uh, hopefully learn something. And I, I got to say, with each episode, I, I learn something myself, uh, totally new and different, and it changes my perspective on things. So, um, and I know for a fact that there are people out there watching and our numbers have been going up and i wanted to say uh thank you very much for that it's slow but steady we're a very small channel here um but i really appreciate very much your your viewership um if you're interested in following me and mml and some of the other folks that you often see here on the channel uh you can always stop by our our other our other uh, platforms on Twitter and, and Facebook for as long as they last and they're out there. Um, though I usually say this as well, uh, I'm not very good at updating them with much more than like pictures of cats and uh, complaints about like politics and, and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I hope that maybe uh, you will check us out there, but we are primarily here on the YouTube platform. Um, so before we sort of begin tonight, I just wanted to take care of a little bit of bookkeeping. Uh, I had made a grand announcement, and I had said that last Friday we were going to run episode six of Sword in the Darkness, which uses Monty Cook's cipher system as its gaming engine. It's a kind of Cthulian adventure uh, set. Uh, well, it's like a Cthulian adventure cross with the French Revolution. Um, and I was up the night before with, with a little cat that was, was having a little bit of digestion problems and a little bit of, of bathroom problems. Uh, she's getting older here in, in her years. And um, I had, you know, being kind of old school, I used to be at work at a film studio and a television studio. I always sort of thought to myself, ah, the, the show must go on. But I was up all night with her. And then the next day I was teaching. And uh, to be honest, when I got home that afternoon, I was just, I had a headache. I was tired. And I've sort of learned, and I guess my players have learned, that, you know, this is an experience that's supposed to be fun and enjoyable for everybody. Um, it's not supposed to feel like a slog or like uh, something that's sort of like mandatory. And I decided to take a nap. And, and I slept. Um, my players are very understanding. Thank you very much to them. I know they were a little disappointed because with our last episode, we had had a very dramatic event and reached kind of a climactic point. Uh, I want to thank them very much for their understanding on that and apologize to you, the viewer, uh, for, for that little gap. That little, that little tooth that you keep putting your tongue in and you're like, what the heck, where did it go? Uh, we will be back in a couple weeks. We'll Most likely we'll be back with Sword in the Darkness on Friday, May 12th. Um, but the truth is we're also exploring other options because we seem to get a lot of people watching on a Wednesday. That seems to be a more popular date than Fridays. I think all the cool people are out doing stuff on a Friday and, and the, the really cool people are doing their stuff on a Wednesday. So we may be doing that. Watch, watch YouTube, subscribe, look for pictures of cats and wade between them and find those, those dates for the exact adventure. Um, the other thing, or the exact date, the other thing I want to announce is that in a few weeks, for sure, I do have an exact date on this. Um, I am actually going to be having the crew, Brandon Atten and Matthew Orr, from a company called Wet Ink Games. They uh, created a game which I thought was really super cool. I had never heard of it until I saw it here on a bookshelf at, um, at a, a game store in Cambridge. Um, the game is called Never Going Home, and it is essentially a horrific take on World War I trench combat. It's a very specific kind of look at it. And when I saw that book sitting there, I almost fell over. But before I fell over, one of the man the manager said, hey, buddy, don't, don't knock over 
all of the shelves like dominoes or anything. And he said, here, buddy, go ahead and try this game out. And I took a look. At, I mean, it looks super cool. It looks actually, to be honest, um, the artwork in it reminds me a lot of a little board game called The Grizzled that uh, is actually done by um, some of the artists from uh, Charlie Hebdo. Uh, which, at any rate, that's kind of a very like tenuous kind of link there. But Never Going Home just looked super cool. Uh, I'm very interested, of course, in horror. I'm very interested in World War I. If you guys watched The Fierce Brood a few years ago, that was the stream that kind of started us off. Um, so I'll, I'll have those folks on the program uh, May 16th. Um, but you know what? You're sitting there asking yourself. You're saying, Matt, you just can't shut up, can you? You've got like an awesome guest tonight. And you just go on and on and on. And yes, I know. My mother is texting me right now to say, Matt, you're being a rude host. Get to your get to the meat and potatoes of tonight. Um, tonight's guest is uh, a really, uh, I, I would say a legendary figure um, for, for quite a few reasons. Um, last, uh, last episode, I had, uh, Jess Penley on the program and, uh, she is an up and comer who with, uh, her, her partner in crime, Keith Penley is actually creating, uh, a, a game for Cypher called Harrow the Blighted Plane. And when I talked to Jess, I was thinking a lot about how she's, she and, and Keith are taking a, a love and a passion and they're on the verge of turning it into like something that they can kind of make an income from and they can div you know turn into their lives now the reason why I mentioned that program is because tonight I have someone on the program who is probably best known for the setting that they created called Eberron um, but the interesting thing when I look back and I do a lot of research into my guests and he'll, he'll let me know like what I've gotten right and wrong and he'll, he'll help, uh, correct the record. The interesting thing is that to me, when, when I looked at Keith Baker's like past here, the big thing I think that sort of sets him apart is that he, he entered a competition that Wizards was having, um, and he took a one, and, and again, he's going to straighten out all the information on this. He took a, 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 he went from a one page document on, yeah, rough idea of a setting, which was, had a different title and I would assume had a very different sort of look and feel, but I don't know. Um, he went from that and, and with like several thousand other contestants and applicants, he was narrowed down uh, with the group to something like a hundred and then I think down to three. He was flown out to Wizards of the Coast uh, to work together with with like people like legends. Uh, Bill Slavisek, uh, I had him on the show by the way. If you want to look for him, he came on the show a couple times. Go check it out. Um, Bill Slavisek and uh, I believe Chris Perkins and I, I think quite a few other people he was working with uh, at the time to develop the setting. And now he's sort of come full circle. So uh, again, my mom is getting annoyed. She's like, why don't we let Keith, tell the story. Let's get to, ladies and gentlemen, Keith Baker, the uh, creator of the legendary Eberron setting. Um, Keith, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. How's it going? It's going okay. It's very hot here in Moab, Utah. That's... So if I look like I'm sweating a little, I am. It's very you, hot here. You, sir, are an international, or at least national, traveler now uh there was a little bit of international i'm going to toronto okay there we go international crossing the border there um how many different places have you been in like in the last week you were telling me before the new york city uh washington dc moab uh portland toronto coming up five is... in about four weeks is this just a normal part of Keith Baker's life? Is at any given moment, will be he be in, is he like, are you, I'm talking about he, like in the third person. Are are you- He is a man of mystery. Are you the sort of, are, are you like the, the little atom at the center of like, or the nucleus that like may be in two or three different places at the same time or? I haven't been for a while because of the pandemic, you know? So I was just uh, in Portland for years. 
Uh, but now I'm starting to, to pick that pace back up again. I did in 2009, I actually traveled around the world running Eberron games for anyone who would put me up for three nights. And so that was very interesting. There I was definitely an international, uh, you know, dungeon master. But at the moment, this is unusual. I, I look forward to actually being settled for a few weeks at a time and getting to focus on work. Yeah, it's funny. Like when I did a lot of travel for my work, people would look at me and go, wow, that's so exciting. But then I'd be like living out of a suitcase every time. And yeah. I wouldn't tell them that part. I just tell them, yeah, it's great. I was here. I was there. Well, it's the same as being a professional game designer. You say that and everyone says, oh, that must be fun. And it is compared to flipping burgers or, you know, various other things one could do. But there's still days where you're filling in a spreadsheet, you know, or things like that. It's not like every moment is a, uh, uh, you know, edge of your seat uh, excitement. Well, let's maybe start there then. Can you tell me what is it about RPGs, either maybe as a player or game master or as a designer, mm -hmm. that really kind of like hooked you? Like when, when did you start playing? And so I got the uh, the D and D white box when I was around eight years old, and the hardcover AD and D first edition books, and I wasn't ready to play them at that point, but I loved just reading them, and especially like the monster manual. This was like the coolest book ever. It's got all these pictures. It's got monsters, you know. So, um, and then I started playing probably when I was about eleven or twelve. I started mm -hmm. running games for people. And to me, what I love most about role-playing games is that they are collaborative and that they – so much entertainment in our world is passive. You read a book and you can't really do anything with it. You watch a show or a movie. Uh, even with a computer game, I am actively controlling the movements of my character, but I can't do anything that the designer hasn't mm. thought of. If I see a tree and I say, I want to climb that tree, unless the game allows you to climb trees, unless people have already thought about that, it's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a D and D session, if I say you're walking down the road and the player says, I want to climb a tree, I may have never thought of them doing it, but I can think of it now. Mm -hmm. We can figure out what's going to happen. You know, it is, um, I told you about traveling in 2009. I ran the same adventure for 60 different groups of players. And the point is, every time something happened I never seen before, something you know new came up, and that that's what I love. That with that that particular scenario, what's cool about it is that I love the story. For me, it's as much fun seeing people play it as it is to watch a really good episode of a TV show I like. Mm -hmm. And yet, every time I play it, I, I get to see something new. I get to wonder how they're going to solve the problems. I get to, you know, and so. Even having run that 60 times, I could run it again tonight and I would be still excited to do it because I want to see what this group does. And so that's what I really love. A, a friend of mine, someone I actually met on that journey, described it as personal mythology because of the point that if you see myths as something that help define a culture mm -hmm. within a group of friends – we are creating stories that have meaning for us that we can tell again. You remember that time that Matt tried to, you know, uh, knock down the door and roll a one and broke his foot. And, you know, just, again, things that, that bind us together as a group, even if they have no meaning to anyone else. So those are all the things I love that compared to other gaming where we experience something someone else has made for us. When we do role playing, it's something that we do together, and we create right. something unique. It's it's interesting that you say that, and I've I've said this a, a few times before on the show, and I've looked into this. So what's interesting is that the same the same things that fire up your imagination, your imagination is fired up in the same way that reality fires it up. If this makes any sense, so if you're watching, mm -hmm. like if you're looking there and you're watching like a panther run across like a field or something and then attacking another animal, um, that's getting burned in your brain as a memory. But if you are sort of creating the memory with some friends or reading in a book, the memory, the same place that that real image of the panther in your head goes is the same place where the imaginary panther that you're imagining goes. So for all intents and purposes, 
you know, the rea- I mean, there's a part of your brain that knows that one really happened, and the others are imagination. Um, but what's interesting is that the way that your brain treats them, the excitement that you feel, or maybe the confusion or the, the fear, uh, that part is real, and that's a real memory. So, like, kind of going with what you're saying about the way that you're building shared memories with friends, um, you know, I think I 100% yep. agree with you. It's it's interesting. Uh, that reminds me of the Philip K. Dick short story, uh, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. And, you know, the principle there is if I can give you the memories of having gone on a vacation and I can give you the souvenirs from the vacation, does it actually matter if you never went? And to a certain degree, that is what we do. I'm going to take you on a vacation to Sharn. Hmm. And yes, you've never been there, but if I can give you the experience of it and you can remember it, is it, you know, how is it different? Is this, this may sound like a silly question or I don't know. Do you think that playing a game for four or five hours on a Friday night where you go to some far off land is as much of a relief as actually going to the far off land for four or five hours? I don't know if I'm getting. So I think there's, I think there's two different ways to look at it. On the one hand, you're not getting certain aspects of the experience. On the other hand, you're also not having the stress of travel, the worry, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, any actual travel does come with an awful lot of, uh, you know, frustration and, you know, so you you got the good and the bad. And I think it at least is a imagining we do something is at least uh, has certain advantages. And it is part of the thing where, as I said, I started doing it when I was a kid. Mm. And I think that's the thing. When we're children, we're all about embracing imagination and imagining things and anything is possible. And there is just this tendency as we go older to, oh, you have to stop making things up. You have to start interacting with reality. Um, And, you know, there are reasons too, but it also helps to keep that imagination alive and remember that we can make up anything we can imagine. Yeah, I I sort of see that a lot, I think, in my job. So I'm a teacher and... um... A lot of times I there's this I, I think I'm very lucky in that I can kind of piggyback on the imagination of my kids and where other adults might make excuses like, oh, I'm not going to imagine whatever I can. I can get down in the dirt and be goofy with the kids and pretend to be doing something. And I often find myself kind of thinking, oh, my gosh, what a relief and what a pleasure. Like, I can't believe that as adults, we tell ourselves We've got to like, you know, fly straight. We can't like goof around. We have to be focused and we can do adult games like, you know, maybe play certain things or whatever. But imagination is one of those things that's kind of unless you're like you're allowed to be a writer or a a movie maker or something like that. It's kind of quashed Mm -hmm. in, in a lot of adults, unfortunately, whereas when we're kids, every kid, as far as I know, plays unless you're maybe Egon Spengler. But right. So, um, I got that reference. I know. Thank you. I was, you know, I was thinking of specifically in ghost ghostbusters two, where he says he has a slinky, but he's, he's like, my parents got me a slinky, but I straightened it. Like, that's what I was kind of thinking. (laughs) It's just no fun. Um, so, uh, what would you say you makes like a session enjoyable for, for you then? Do you, uh, uh, do you like to play? Do you like to run? Or actually, oh, so I, I'm, I'm 90% of the time the, the game after, and I always have been. Like I've always been a person who comes up with stories and draws other people into them. I have, I do play. Uh, I've actually been doing, uh, being a player in in a some live play stuff with a channel called Six Sides of Gaming, mm-hmm. and I've been oh, enjoying yeah. that because it's different. Um, I was actually playing in a game with Ed Greenwood, the creator of the Forgotten Realms. I was going to say. And so that's a heap of fun. And um, so I do enjoy that. But most of the time, I am, um, I'm the game master. And for me, I think... Oh, a little bit frozen there. We'll see. First here. and foremost... Mm-hmm. Um, Hoping I wasn't here. Oh, That's um, I think I think you're back I, now. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, first and foremost, what I love is the players having fun. Like that's the main thing: is are the players having a good time? If they're having a good time, I'm going to have a good time. But beyond that, I love it when the players do something that I didn't expect, 
but that I enjoy. You know, so it's not like, oh, they're ruining whatever, right. you know, story I thought was good, but they see something that I wouldn't have seen on my own. Hmm. Because that's the point is when I write a novel and I have written novels, I'm just giving you my perspective. But when the players come in and say, but wait, what about X? And I'm like, hmm. wow, oh, oh, I haven't even thought about that. Yeah, I, I would agree. Those you tend know, to that be, sort of makes it a unique experience. Those tend to be the moments when I give XP. Like the moment in my brain when it feels a little tickled yeah. by something someone said that I hadn't considered, and I'm like, holy crap, that's this is making it a much better story or game or whatever now. There's your XP. And part of that giving away XP is like, oh my God, I'm not prepared for this, so I have to come up with something to delay for just a moment while my brain goes mm -hmm, through the different mm -hmm. like iterations of what I could do with this. But yeah, I love those moments as well. Do you find that um, your enjoyment of the game has changed since, you know, going from say white box D and D to today, like has it changed with your experiences as a designer or as a player or game master or whatever, or. I mean, I certainly uh, do tend to use more free form systems uh, then Dungeons and Dragons, then I do run Dungeons and Dragons monthly on my Patreon. But even there, um, sorry. That's okay. Uh, you know, tell me what you want to do and I'll figure out what you have to roll, you know, to do it. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, we're, we're occasionally getting a little jumpiness here. I'm not sure that's uh, what's okay. going on. It's all part of the internet and, and that's, that's all right. We'll, yeah. we'll do the best that we can so, with it. So it's certainly the case that comparing, looking to like third edition D&D &D to fifth edition, I prefer fifth edition actually because third edition is a better... It's a deeper simulation. It's more complex. Mm. To some degree, I like the greater simplicity because I'm more here for the story mm. and uh, the rules sort of add on to that. So I made my own role-playing system, Phoenix Dawn Command, mm -hmm. um, six years ago. And that is a system that is um, definitely a little more casual than... Um, uh, than some of the, the other ones uh, that are out there. All right, there's a little bit of freezing. Let's see if he pops back in. This is the electricity of live interviews on the internet, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully he will pop back in in just a moment. I'm more driven on the player. Um, there we go. You seem to be back, Keith. Let's You're... see if I can get any more memory here. Yeah, and I'm freezing, but I'm also just trying to... Yeah, I'm trying to close things. <laughs> That's Sorry. Funny. I no. just realized I, I jumped in here early and didn't actually necessarily... Close, oh, close everything up the that might make life easier. To. So I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying That's to just okay. close. This is the electricity, Keith, of a live interview. Uh-oh. <laughs> close everything. See if it helps. Okay. We'll, we'll oh, see. Oh, technology. I know. It's okay, wonderful. Okay, anyhow, it's... carry on. So then yep. if at, at a certain yeah. point, you, you have this enjoyment of the game. And at a certain point, you kind of decide that you want to go professional. Now, I know that you started in, and I, please correct me if I'm wrong, I, I believe you started in video games before you Well, sort of, No? Okay. So here's the thing. You were correct. I did. But okay. the point is, uh, I did decide that I wanted to go professional as a role-playing game designer. Mm -hmm. And I decided that when I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, You had 
one point, what did I want to be when I grow up? Um, connection. Um, but 14, I am holding a book in my hand. Someone made this book. That means that is a job. And I want that job. Mm. And so from the time I was in high school, I knew very much, this is what I want to do. I want to write D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, I just didn't know how to do it. You know, there certainly was no kind of major. So I majored in creative writing and studied history. Um, when I got out of college, I worked in a bookstore. I worked in a coffee shop. And, and then opportunity came up to work in video games. So that's what I did. But that was never what I wanted to do. I wanted to do D and D. It was just there weren't random jobs available uh, to do that. So I started working in computer games at Magna Interactive Studios, moving on to the one. And as I did that I um uh, and um so, anyone? ah okay there we go I think you you kind of snapped back I missed a few words finally in there. got back again that's mm -hmm. uh so so yeah again uh I got a job as a computer game designer and uh you know first as a production assistant initially I was the guy who was getting people coffee mm. my way up um became a designer uh, <laughs> uh technology caught back up again uh so i worked my way up became a designer and then while i was doing that i was always looking for opportunities to do freelance work uh for role-playing games i finally in 2003 mm -hmm. or 2002 i think i was mm -hmm. frustrated because a lot of the games i worked on never came out yeah. And I was frustrated and I said, I have been doing freelancing. I am going to try to quit and freelance full time and see if it works. And that was the year that Wizards announced the fantasy setting search, which produced uh, um, Eberron. So that turned out, worked out just, you know, Beckett. And I also in the following year made the card game Gloom. Uh, so between Gloom and Eberron, yeah, that, that turned out to be a good decision. So when you were freelancing, do you mean you were freelancing at the video game company or were you working video games by day and then in the evenings you were freelancing trying to get your stuff to like RPG designers and publishers? Are you, can you hear me, Keith? No. Uh, yeah, exactly right. I was working a full time in the video game industry, and meanwhile, I was uh, submitting you know small pieces to various game companies. Uh, the first thing I had published was f by Atlas Games, and this is the thing. I think you noted that I worked for Atlas Games. I never mm. worked for Atlas Games. Yeah. I was a freelancer who uh, submitted stuff to Atlas Games. Okay. And but I was never an employee of Atlas mm. Games. And so they published the very first thing I wrote, uh, which was for a penny a word, so you know, big money, mm -hmm. um, for an expansion for a game uh, 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 over the And um, I loved that. I mean, D and D products. So I got feet in doing D and D. It was with Atlas. You know, I did uh, things for En Route. I did uh, things in Touched by the Gods. Um, and then eventually, I created full books for them: uh, the Evan Mare Crime and Punishment. So I had a long relationship with Atlas. But again, I was always a freelancer. Hmm. Um, and then as I started doing that, I did some work for Goodman Games. I did some work for Green Ravine. Oh, wow. uh, and then, uh, but I hadn't actually done any work for Wizards of the Coast before the fantasy setting search. So right. some people were upset when I won the fantasy setting search because they felt I was oh. a professional. And right. the fantasy setting search 
Forge wasn't supposed there there were people in Wizards of the Coast submitting entries. It right. wasn't like it was supposed to be complete a no. Can you hear me okay, Keith? Um, nonetheless, mm -hmm. it's also a huge thing for me to be doing something with it. Man, as we get a little glitch, I'm sorry, folks. No, it's okay, Keith. Uh, I, but I have you were an, saying? I have an idea. Um, how about, if you want, you can log out, and I am actually still able to mm -hmm. hop. Okay. I can go back to a solo shot of just me. I will do a song and dance number for for mm -hmm. our viewers, and then when you hop back in, mm -hmm. if you want to like restart or something like that, um, I think that's a good idea. We can try that. Okay, so uh, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, this is why right. live YouTube is so exciting. Ah, okay, there we go. Well, now now we okay. seem to be working. All right, we can. Help. We will. We will knock. Uh, I'm going to knock on pressed cardboard rather than. You know, because yeah. my desk isn't really made up. I, uh, I, I told you before that it was very hot here, and I my computer was just literally overheating. So I've moved to the coldest place I can find. I've restarted everything, and uh, we'll problem. see how it goes. We'll, we'll give it a shot. My connection looks good. Yeah, and I, I have to say yeah. that, like, the background and everything, it kind of looks like you're in a more stable... Like, the image is more stable. So hopefully... Okay. Fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll do, we'll just keep going with the questions then and, and find out. So you were telling us that, um, and this is actually something I hadn't known, but uh, mm -hmm. you did have background in building stuff, in creating stuff, when you sent in your, uh, your I was going to say your application, your submission for, yes. yep. for, the, for Eberron. But now, from what I understand, though, it was a very different setting than, or or at least the name was very different. And I've read interviews where you've you've said it was very different. But what was it when you sent it in originally? So the name was, uh, so it's a one page, you only sent in a one page submission. So it was a high level concept. And the name of the setting was Thrilling Tales of Swords and Sorcery. Mm. And so the point was from the beginning, it was three things. You know, the description I gave that was imagine Lord of the Rings. Uh, here we go again. Mm -hmm. um, I can hear you. So imagine Lord uh, of the Rings. So the description I gave it was um, imagine Lord of the Rings mixed with Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Maltese Falcon um, mm -hmm. in a world where magic is part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And so it was the three concepts of pulp adventure mm -hmm. which i'd been working on a mmorpg that was a pulp themed mm -hmm. rpg sort of the mummy indiana jones and so i had that vibe and i said let's push that vibe into uh dnd let's add the maltese falcon the big sleep all of that because i love that flavor and let's explore the idea It especially in third edition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we'd had magic in the Renaissance instead of, of our science, what would the world look like 300 years later? Um, and so those were the, the driving points of it. The big difference that uh, I would say is as it was originally depicted, it was more magical. Mm -hmm. It was a world where I was saying like the fighter, you know, is using a rod instead of a bow. You know, what I say is that Eberron, as I originally depicted, it was more like the 1930s. And Eberron, as it is now, is more like the, in like 1890. Oh, wow. That in is... terms of just the feel of the world. Well, that's like a huge different difference. Like when I think of the 1930s versus the, you know, the 1890s, like very, very different. So that's like super dramatic. What, what was it then that caused maybe the shift? Um, was it a recommendation from someone else or was it the more you thought about some of the themes of it? You're like, oh, maybe it should be 
several different decades earlier or what caused the shift? Yeah. So you mentioned the process and the process was send in one page and that's just come up with an idea. And that's what I did. Then they did, you moved it to 10 pages. So I, you know, I was surprised when they picked it. I was like, wow, really? Okay, right. sure. Yeah. You know, so suddenly I had to try and actually make this crazy high concept an right. actual world. Um, so I expanded it to 10. And then when they had the three finalists bring us all up to Seattle individually and say, this is what we like about your idea. This is what we change. And so they liked the overall flavor of Eberron, but the concern was that it wouldn't feel enough like D&D. And that was sort of one of the main points is ultimately the end of the day, we still want people wearing armor and fighting with swords and bows. Like that's just part of what makes D&D D&D. And if I completely abandoned that and said, we're riding around on flying carpets and, you know, shooting each other with wands, yeah. that is a different a significantly different flavor and that's as i said that difference between the 1890 and the the you know 1930s it's we have air travel but it's just getting started we have what amounts to a telegraph but we don't have telephones or radio like you know we still we've got these trappings of essentially a higher tech but it still doesn't feel too crazy to be riding a horse and swinging a sword ah uh, okay right and so it's if that just, makes any sense no it does it's it's kind of like a gradual sort of like a reconciliation between what perhaps the the publisher it's a maybe a practical consideration of the part of the publisher can combined with like a sort of an aesthetic that they're going for matched right. and, and mixed together with what you had maybe originally been thinking right. of. So, and... Yeah, so they liked the the idea, you know, the, the two-fisted detective, you know, the, uh, you know, the explorer going into the, the lost world, you know, fighting on the deck of a burning airship. Like, they liked all of those things. They just wanted to make sure it still fundamentally felt like D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. So then... At this point, though, you were saying you couldn't believe that they picked it. And there were several mm -hmm. rounds, right? So there's the first round, it's a one-page thing. Then it's a 10-page yep. thing, right? Then mm -hmm. is the next and final one, is that the the like the one where you can make it into the top three? No. So so top three was from the 10-pager. From oh. the 10-pager, we wrote 100 pages. And then once they picked that, that is where I then started working with Chris and James and Bill directly uh, to make the final book. So how long did you have to run the hundred to the to write the hundred pager? Maybe three months, two or three. It was fast work to be sure. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, holy cannoli, I'd be like so stressed. Like were you, so did you just drop everything and you sort of focused? 24 hours a day. Just I mean, me. I had the advantage that I could because I quit my job, you know, uh, the previous year. And so, as I said, it was an unexpectedly good timing uh, for me on that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then they fly you out after you've written this and you're sitting mm -hmm. on the plane. Mm -hmm. And and like, what are you thinking in your head? Like, were you like, yeah, I, I think I did a pretty good job or man, I can't believe this. How did they pick it? Like, was there like, what were your feelings when you so it's it's sort of the opposite of that was my feeling when they picked me for when they picked the ten pager, you know when when I got the phone call saying yeah you're you're in the next round and among other things you couldn't tell anyone that by oh. the time when they picked the final three they told everyone who they were so like I could tell people I couldn't tell them what it was but I could tell them oh yeah I'm working on this this thing for wizards right. Whereas when they picked us to do the 10 pages, and there was only 11 people in that round. Yeah. So it was 11,000 to 11 to three. Um, and when they picked just the, you know, so they picked me out of 11,000 people. That was both this amazing, I can't believe they chose it. I can't believe, can I make this idea work? Mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't tell anyone. Whereas by the time I got to the hundred pager, you know, the, and was done with that, I knew it was pretty good. Like I felt like, yeah, okay. 
you know, and I knew the elements of it they liked. You know, they told me like they like this idea of magic being approached in a more scientific way of the the thing. So at that point, it was it was exciting. It was you know tense to be sure, but nowhere near that experience of when they picked you know you out of the eleven thousand. So, so if you took those three months off, like from a practical standpoint, like are you thinking? all right, well, I'll write this 100 pages. If it doesn't work out, I'll have 100 pages that I know will be, that are pretty good, I'm pretty passionate about, and maybe you'll take it somewhere else, or? Well, they, so this is the thing, the 10 pages you were doing on spec, the final, the three finalists, they paid us all $20,000 right up front wow. to do to write the 100 pages. Hmm. And they, but that was with the understanding that they would own those 100 pages, they would own the idea. So first off, as a freelance writer, yeah. twenty thousand dollars for a couple months work was yeah, was good, you know. And a lot of people have said, "How could you? How could you? You know, sell the idea?" And I'm like, as a freelance writer, that was great, yeah, you know. And especially just the chance to work with wizards. So the point was, I knew if they didn't take it, it was it was going to be their idea anyway. And that right. is the case with the other two settings. No one, I I have no idea. I don't know what what those two settings were because they've never been released. You know, right. you know, no one knows. Um, and that could have been Eberron as it was since they picked it. You know, now everybody knows. Um, but the point was they paid $20,000 for the 100 pages, and then they paid another $100,000 for Eberron, for the rights to Eberron. Mm. And so, again, on the one hand, yeah, am I sad that, that you know, I don't have any control over the setting? Sure. But as a freelance writer trying to get started, was one hundred twenty thousand dollars worth? Yeah, <laughs> worth doing it. Absolutely. Um, you know that was again more money. You know that was enough as a freelance writer. That was that was easily a good yeah. two years sort of income. So that gave me the opportunity to then do things like make loom and you know make the other things that I did. So it was it was a huge uh, you know stroke. I don't want to say stroke of luck because, like I said, I worked hard to make it happen. Yeah. But I, what I've said before is I definitely feel like I'm the luckiest nerd in the world just because not that they picked my name out of a hat, but the mere fact that they decided to do the thing at all right. was a tremendous stroke of, of you know, good fortune for me. So I feel very lucky. The, the interesting thing to me is um... – and I again, I think that this is a good moment where this kind of dovetails with the interview I did a couple of weeks ago with Jess Penley. We were kind of talking about the idea that people tend to sort of fall in love with one idea, maybe without like any kind of a sense of like finish finishing the goal. So, for example, I will, you know, I work on my homebrew settings all the time, but there's no ultimate real goal beyond playing those games. And so I never quite move, this is going to sound odd, but I never quite move on from each setting. Whereas if you look at, say, people that write novels, uh, novelists or uh, film directors, they make a movie, they move on to the next one. They yeah. write a book, they move on to the next one. There are some cases, and it's particularly in like the fantasy genre or the science fiction genre, where a, a, a writer will kind of linger on an idea for three, four, five books. Um, but then they sort of, you know, they, they don't move on. But for the most part, a lot of artists, I think, one thing that they, and, and I don't mean this as a, as a, to put them down at all. I think this is a very human thing. And I see this as a teacher. A lot of our artists lack the confidence to think, oh, I can come up with another awesome idea in six months. Right. Um, I'm not worried about it. Like, and I think your idea of like, hey, I'll sell it to them. Yeah. Like I, to me, it shows like a, whether you maybe know it or not, it shows a confidence in your ability to be like, hey, I did this once. Ah, I'll do it again next year. And, right. And and that was the point is also because I had not been playing in Eberron before. This wasn't like this was my childhood D&D setting that I was finally giving away. Like, you know, at Greenwood, Forgotten Realms was his home campaign. And, and Eberron, I made up for that one pager. Hmm. And I incorporated elements into it from things I had done in the past, certainly as I made it bigger and grander. Mm. But the whole point was I did just make it up mm. so I can make up another one, mm. you know? So yeah. it is exactly that is, uh, again, 
just because it's out there and there's things I wish I could do that I can't. Sure, I wish, you know, it'd be great if I owned it, but I definitely don't regret you know, for a moment, uh, right. the decisions that I made, it was a huge, uh, you know, a huge opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. And it's thrilling that again, so many people have had a chance to experience the world and make their story because of the reach of, uh, wizards and all of that. So I'm, as I said, I feel very lucky. Yeah. And I mean, this is something I was later going to sort of talk about, but I suppose it's, it kind of fits right now too. I mean, Eberron is still around. It's not yeah. like it was something that was pretty popular for a few years, and and it's still around in a time when five e uh, the you know like five e being released and all of that stuff, they're being a little bit slower about re- like releasing the material. I think at one point they decided I, I I may have this wrong, but I remember reading somewhere or hearing, okay, we're not going to release a ton of books, we're just going to release some really good books slowly at a at like a slow kind of cadence and and take it easy and put a lot of effort and quality and, uh, and time into them and i mean what got released but but eberron you know like mm-hmm. there are other settings that people were calling out for and and wanting and but but they went back to eberron and it's still there and it's still around it's yeah. got staying power it's, it's uh, you know, and I mean, just looking to the past, there's about 40 novels written in Eberron, mm-hmm. uh, two computer games, one of which is still there. You know, you can still play D&D online, and that's that in Eberron. Uh, and, um, you know, aside from that, the DMs Guild, uh, you know, now now anyone can write Eberron books. And I know a couple of people who are writing good ones. And obviously, I've written products mm. for the DMs Guild over the years. Which have done quite well. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, it's it is. I am thrilled that the community, certainly, it's smaller than the following for Forgotten Realms, but there's a strong community out there that yeah. is still having a lot of fun with Eberron, and that's that's a thrill. Twenty years later, you know, what was it like? Um, so, I guess you were working when they flew you out there. You were working personally to mm-hmm. shape it with with Bill Slavisek and. Chris Perkins and James Chris Wyatt. Chris Perkins, James Wyatt, yeah. Were, were you kind of, you guys kind of met 9 a.m. on Monday morning, sat down, and you're like, okay, this is what we're going to do, and you just, for a few weeks. Yes, so. we did. Wow. Yeah, it was it was about two weeks that we would come in, we would all sit around a table, we would talk about various particular issues. You know, ultimately, we would divide up, you know, sections of the book. Uh, so who was going to write what? You know, I'm going to write the countries, Bill's going to write the, you know, equipment, Uh James was, James did most of the mechanics, you know, so, and that was part of the thing is when I did the hundred pager, part of the rules of it um, were, we we should suggest if we wanted new ancestry or new classes, Mm -hmm. uh, but we shouldn't try and create, you know, so in other words, I said, Eberron should have the artificer, the artificer would be like a magical engineer. You know, this is the general concept, but I did not try to actually create the artificial class because that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted the story. And, uh, you know, and that when we got there, that's because they've got people like James who, you know, that they were professionals at creating things like classes and monsters and species. So I created the idea of the Warforged. James went through a whole lot of like drawing board ideas of how the Warforged should actually work in play. Um, but there were a lot of things where we just went through sort of the things that were cool that they liked in the setting and the things where they thought, like, how can we make this cooler? So, again, one of the, the key points I, I always bring up, because it really sticks in my mind, uh, my mind, and it's something I loved, is I always had the nomadic halflings on the planes, uh, and that was always sort of part of the thing, and... We're in the room and everyone's saying, well, we love this idea, but, you know, maybe they could like, what if they were writing something more interesting? And and we all argue over who it was. I feel it was James because I think James had a five-year-old son and he was like, what about dinosaurs? Mm-hmm. And we were all like, yes, halfling on a raptor. Like that's, right. that's you know, that's what we need. And... And it was great because D- you know, dinosaurs had been in D&D since the beginning, but most settings don't really use them much. Mm-hmm. And that image of the halfling riding a, riding a raptor is such a great image. Yeah. And so that's a perfect example of, as I said, the core idea was already there, but it's in this conversation where we're just, how do we just kick it up 
up just a little more dinosaurs, boom. And that's the kind of, of place where, you know, I definitely came up with the core of Eberron, but just a lot of interesting little pieces of it came out of that collaboration of just us all sitting around sort of bouncing off each other. And this comes back to what I was saying that I love about role playing uh, mm -hmm. in general is it is that point of what they had was my solitary vision. And what we ended up with came out of four people sitting in a room saying how, you know, bouncing off each other, saying, I like that, but yes, and yeah. And that's how we ended up with what we've got. Is um is there was there, is there like an overriding kind of philosophy behind Eberron? Or was it just sort of like, you know what, I'm gonna this is gonna be fun. Let's let's put cool raptors in there. Let's do this. Let's do that. Or was there kind of like a theme that kind of united everything that the three or everybody else yeah. kind of worked? Well, as I say, it's it's the three pillars to me are pulp adventure, noir intrigue, magic, everyday magic. Mm -hmm. And it was always those three things. So on the one hand, you wanted over the top action. You wanted the hear the players to feel like big damn heroes, mm -hmm. you know. And that's one of the things we said. And in fact, in the the first two books, there is like here is a list of ten things you should know about Eberron. And you know, mm -hmm. it's that's the core principles. Is uh, you know, is that point that we wanted you know in this setting, player characters are supposed to be remarkable. You are supposed to feel. Mm -hmm from the start you are you have potential to make a difference hmm. um and so on the one hand you had that that's also where action points came from it was a way to say players should be able to beat the odds they should be able right. to do something larger than life um at the same time then the next part was the noir part and the part of noir was putting in things like saying stories don't have to always end well hmm. good and evil are not always clear-cut the uh, monsters aren't always bad guys and the bad guys aren't always monsters. You know, that uh, it, it reduced the impact of alignment a great deal. One of the things we also did is it was the first place where we said clerics don't have to match the alignment of their deity. You can have an evil cleric in the mm -hmm. Church of the Silver Flame. Mm -hmm. um, and further, we took the point of saying, and we don't actually know for sure if the gods exist. That this is a setting where faith matters because you can't go and meet, you know, our right. Orion. Uh, and part of that point was because a world in which you can go and shake Thor's hand, there is a certainty that, you know, uh, to things. And what we wanted to say is everyone is a place where there is no absolute certainty. There is mm -hmm. no one who can 100% tell you this is right and wrong. You're going to have to make those decisions yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so so those are those those key points. You know, epic adventure, players are remarkable, yet at the same time, good and evil aren't always clear cut. Mm. Things aren't always certain. You're going to have difficult decisions. And then layered on top of that is the point of magic as a science and how does that evolve and how does it affect the development of civilizations? Mm. And so always, you know, part of that point to me is if I'm saying I'm doing an Eberron one shot for people, uh, who may not have played, I always want to say, like, how am I working the way magic works in this world? And what am I throwing in that you're like, oh, I wouldn't see that in Lord of the Rings, mm. you know? And so you always want to have that sort of element in there. Um, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, please. Oh. Can... Uh, I, I would just throw two more things. One of the things in particular, because part of the point was I was always in my mind contrasting it to Forgotten Realms, uh, not because there was anything wrong, but because Front Ground Realms was what people had. Right. And so saying like, okay, what are we doing? What's a story we can tell in Eberron that you can't tell there? First of all, the, the idea that the gods, we don't know if they exist, that was a huge shift from Forgotten Realms. And the similar point was the idea of saying we don't want powerful, benevolent NPCs in the world. There is no Elminster. There is no Drizzt. And the whole idea of that was to say that really at the end of the day, if you're a player and you're trying to fix the world you know this is a world that needs heroes uh there is no no one else who can solve the problem that you're facing most of the benevolent npcs who are powerful the keeper of the silver flame the great druid are severely handicapped in some way uh the great druid is a tree you know the keeper of the silver flame if she leaves flame keep she loses 14 levels for power you know so there are concrete reasons 
in in like the Forgotten Realms, you kind of have to say, why isn't Elminster solving this problem if it's a big deal? Right. In Eberron, there is no no one, there is no safety net, you know, to uh to the people who have that kind of power are more likely to be a problem than to actually uh you know be there to solve the problems for you. It 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 does remind me very, very much of like the whole noir genre. Like, of course, noir films mm-hmm. are in black and white. Uh, but there are just nothing but levels of gray, and there really aren't any heroes there to save anyone, and the choices are never clear cut, and they're very, infre- very uh, infrequently are they so satisfying and and so like binary. Um, are are you? Did you read like a lot of noir fiction? I know I know that you mentioned a few titles there, but do you read a lot? Was that something that was on your mind then? Oh, Is yeah. it still on your mind or? Oh, absolutely. No, I love, uh, you know, um, Chandler, Philip Marlowe. Uh, you know, I will also say that another thing I love is cyberpunk. And there's cyberpunk draws heavily on noir. Mm. And uh, in some ways, you know, Eberron is cyberpunk in that same way that it's drawing on noir roots, but it's magic, you know, where cyberpunk is technology. And it's saying, well, what's the impact of magic onto this? So part of the point is, if you look to Eberron 2, one of the things you have are the dragon-marked houses. And the dragon-marked houses are these immense, powerful, magical monopolies that control segments of the economy. And they do essentially fill the same role as megacorporations in cyberpunk. And it's sort of this idea of we have, because of the second point I was going to mention, the last war, the established old kingdoms have fallen, Mm. you know, that it was torn apart, and now they're... They're all weakened, and one of the themes in the world is does any kingdom have the power to actually enforce its will over the dragon marked houses, or are the houses now stronger than any one nation? And that that's very cyberpunk. The issues, right. And that combined with the impact of the last war itself, which has a lot of themes of nobody won the war, uh, it ended in this terrible cataclysm in the morning which has left us in a cold war scenario and and so that also is the is a very noir kind of bleak you know there was this war that was a civil war in the first place it wasn't even fought for a great reason nobody won it we lost an entire nation and we have refuge people have lost their homeland and so that gives you both a lot to chew on mm. as a player you know how did this impact me um, but also it flavors the tone of the world. And this is one of the things I love about Eberron is from the start, when you just start to play and you say, I'm going to play a dwarf fighter, the first thing I can say to you is, well, until two years ago, the you know, quarter was at war. What did you do? And that immediately says, did you fight? Right. If you did fight, who'd you fight for? If you right. didn't fight, why didn't you fight? What were you doing instead? You're a fighter. You know, were you were you an enforcer for the criminal group? Were you a conscientious objector? Like, what's your deal? Because you're a fighter. And so either they you did fight, and then we immediately get, okay, who did you fight for? Or if you fought for Seer, which was the nation was destroyed, how do you feel about that? You know, you've got the, the very easy, I like to say it's the Firefly story of the group of adventurers who were Syrian soldiers mm. who had no homeland now. And you've got these skills, but, you know, what are you going to do with them? Like, that's a very easy, boom, we're adventurers, because what else can we do? Um, Whereas, on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of other different kinds of stories you can tell there. But it immediately gives people hooks, and it immediately – it's not directly based on anything in our world – but we understand mm. the impact of war. We understand the the challenge of dealing with an influx of refugees, and we understand the concern about rising corporate power. Mm. So that's sort of the point of all of these things, even though it's in the context of a fantasy setting, are things that do resonate for us because of our everyday lives. And so yeah. that was certainly something, yeah. Well, I was going to say, it reminds me a lot about of of something Frank Miller, the the comic writer artist, he said that mm-hmm. good good science fiction is actually about today, and I think that the inverse can be true as well. I mean, I think good fantasy or good uh, it it mm-hmm. can be about today as well, and that's actually something okay. that not to knock on the 
general D and D stuff, but I think it's one of the things that never quite caught me, even though I love D and D and I, I play it like a lot. Um, I think one of the things that always kind of maybe didn't connect with me is the fact that it seems very distant from what the, the themes and the ideas seem a little bit apart from what is happening now. And one thing I've always appreciated mm-hmm. about like stories and, and the stuff, especially that I run myself, is that it's often a reflection of what's going on now, but it's just sort of disguised. Oh. Right. It, it's, it's to me, the point is, I don't want a fantasy world that I create to just feel like, oh, it's just our world with new names. But I like there to be touchstones that yeah. feel like, like I said, the, the Dragon Mark houses, they're not yes. Amazon and Google, you know, but the concept of uh, a corporation which may have become too big for us to stop is something that we get. You know, and likewise, the last war, it's not World War I, it's not World War II, but there are elements you can draw from either one that you can say, oh, the morning was kind of like Hiroshima. You know what I mean? You can get those sort of things so that it it clicks in a way, even though, again, it's not just a carbon copy of something that happened in our world. Well, it's even interesting when you think about it, because if you think back historically, like to, of course... Of course, you can think back to nations the way they were 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago. And what's remarkable is that there are some corporations like, you know, like the India, like trade and tea yeah. uh, that, that stand out even Medici today. Banks. Yes. Sure. And, and what's what's uh, really, really stunning about that is these corporations are in your head in the same way that the name of a country might be. And they have a historical significance where they played a role mm-hmm. in settling a nation, in colonizing a nation, in mm-hmm. like trade, in the rise and fall of nations. And I like the idea, like what you were describing um, about uh, the different factions and organizations. And what's really interesting to me is the fact that in order to create your your character in the setting, you've got to think back to what's gone before and and create that hook. And, and that hook is probably going to make you a very gray kind of character, whereas mm-hmm. in another setting, it might be a little bit more straightforward, like, oh, I whatever, whatever, whatever. But here, like, you've got to kind of reconcile what you're doing now with the history of like 10, 15, 20 years ago or whatever. And and that's something in, in the fifth edition book, Rising from the Last War. There's a couple tables we I, we put in that I enjoyed. One of them was, what did you do during the war? Hmm. You know, did you fight if you didn't? You know, here are these things. But one of the tables I actually really loved is there's a table that is called, uh, uh, why do you need 240 gold pieces? And it is just a little random table that you can sort of do instead of a flaw. And it's like, oh, because there you ran afoul of the Bormar clan and there's a price on your head. Oh, you had a magic sword, but you pawned it and you need 240 gold pieces to get it back from the pawn shop before they get rid of it. And hey, by the time you can get that, you can have a magic sword. You know, I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, oh, you've been offered a membership in an exclusive secret society, you know, but oh, you've got to write the money. You know, and and what I like about it is it is that idea of just starting and Solo has a price on his head, mm. you know, of that sometimes it's fun to have a character who has something they should regret or a problem to deal with or an obstacle to overcome. Mm. And, um, you know, that that's part of the noir story is heroes. This is where we combine the pulp and the noir. Because the pulp is that we say, you're remarkable, you're a badass, you can do amazing things. But the noir is, okay, but you're not perfect. Mm. You know, you've probably made mistakes. You've mm. probably got trouble uh, to deal with. And and that, again, where everyone falls is in the middle of all that. Everything that you talked about kind of like so far, it really sort of burns this idea of you in my brain as being this, this sort of world builder and setting uh, designer and and kind of like an is like it's almost it's historical in in a way like you're building histories here mm-hmm. um i know that and and you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think a year or two after the the book debuted uh you had written uh the city of towers which was was that your mm-hmm. first book yes so yep. w- how how was it making a shift from what i assume is a very different kind of discipline writing prose based around 
creating a foundation for other people to create a main story in and then sort of saying, okay, we got that, but now I'm going to create the main story and, and sort of, I assume it will have root in okay. the, the setting that you made. How is it different or how is it, uh, uh, how did you make the shift? You're right. It, now it is absolutely different. Now the, the counter to that is that I always also did want to write and I did major in creative writing, you know, oh, so it's go. not like I didn't have any, right. you know, any background in that, uh, among, among other things, it comes back to that point of, I didn't know how you get the job to be a D and D writer. I did understand the basic concept of how you get a job to be a writer. Mm. So the fact that I hadn't written a novel doesn't mean that I hadn't written short stories in my, um, D and D writing, a lot of times I would open a chapter with like a paragraph of a story. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the funny thing is the one pager of Eberron started with a paragraph of a story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, of course, an over the top ridiculous story. But, you know, the, the, the first thing on that one page was he was sharpening a dagger when she walked in. Or his, his name was Mickey Redblade. Mm -hmm. He was sharpening a dagger. He was three feet of trouble, the most beautiful halfling he'd ever seen. But he could see it in her eyes. She was in danger. And it was just that point of just saying, okay, boom, that's the story we're telling. Right. Now you get it. You know, he's a dwarf detective and uh, the, the sexy halfling is in trouble. And, um, and again, so while I hadn't written a full novel, and that was certainly a change, you know, I, I, it wasn't completely crazy because I did understand the principles of um storytelling i will say that i think some of it's editing some of it's just it being the first time um that my second series i like better than my first just because i learned a lot of lessons from the the first story so the thorn of brainland series i think is just i have figured out more of what i like in a story part of it is the dreaming dark series is very much it's not based on any adventure I ever ran, but mm -hmm. it is very much the story of a party of adventurers. It is, here's four adventurers, and they travel around the world trying to deal with a big threat. And the main point about it is while it's good, while they go through places that are Eberron locations, it isn't a story that feels like it could only be told in Eberron. It is a classic, here is a party of adventurers dealing with a problem. When I got to the next series, Thorn of Brayland, I was basically more saying let me stop here and say, what is a story mm. that is not, you know, it doesn't need to be a party of adventurers. This isn't a module. You know, what is going to be a better story and what is a story that can only be told in Eberron? Mm. And so the Thorn of Brainland series, first off, focuses on one character instead of four characters. And she's one character with a sentient dagger that is her partner. But, you know, it's still, it's a tighter focus. And she is a spy. And the point is that lets us say, what does espionage look like in a world where magic is part of everyday life? Mm. You know, how do you, you uh, how does surveillance work? How does counterintelligence, you know, I mean, like, and as I said, it's, it's a matter of that's a story that wouldn't fit in Forgotten Realms because it doesn't have the same prevalence of magic. It doesn't have the same interactions with monsters. Mm. And so, as I say, it was a learning experience of, I think the Dreaming Dark is fine but without that perspective, you know, I didn't have the ability to say, yeah, maybe I don't want a full party of adventurers. Maybe, you know, if you see what I'm saying. I, I totally get it. And I yeah, it's kind of is set in charm. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of what you had said earlier about running the same adventure multiple times. And I had sort of mentally ticked off a, a note to myself to ask you. Um, I, I think what you're, I think in a way, like I think sometimes when people sit down to write something or they create something, I feel like the first iteration people uh, of just when you're writing a draft, even you write down your draft and then that tells you at the end of the draft what you didn't want to write. And and right. you're like, wait a minute. OK, I don't need this. I don't need that. I really meant to have like a moment where this happens and I meant the tension to rise here and there. So you sit down and you write your second draft and you kind of perfect it and i and i've I, I sense that with what you're saying like writing the first series of novels about eberron you're almost in a way learning about eberron with the first series and now you're like okay i get more about what it is and what it isn't let me show you what it really what we can really do with it exactly and part of the point is when i wrote city of towers 
Eberron had only been out for a year. You know, I didn't know. No one knew what Eberron was because we hadn't had time to really explore it. Hmm. And um, and so I will just say with the Thorn of Braylon books, aside from me having more experience as a writer, I also had a lot more experience with the setting with what I thought was really compelling about it. The second book, The Son of Kyber, really gets in. You know, so the Thorn of Braylon books really do sort of highlight things I personally love. The first book deals with Droam, the nation of monsters. And part of the point of that was Eberron approaches monsters in a very different way. You know, Droam is this nation of monsters, and it was in some ways a political thriller where, you know, the player is dealing with hags and medusas, you know, and, and sort of it's just a very different way of engaging with creatures that are traditionally you go and stab them with swords. And here you're negotiating with them, you know, for recognition as a sovereign nation. Uh, the second one, the son of Kyber, deals very much with the dragon marked houses, just as we were talking about, uh, before, with this sort of degree of are the dragon you know, the houses have too much power? Uh, you know, she is a spy working for Braylon, but is Braylon just basically working for House Kenneth at this point? Mm -hmm. You know, and how does she feel about that? And so, as I said, it's sort of those are, to me, more engaging, unique parts about Eberron, whereas the Dream Dark series, again, while I love it, is still a sort of running along as we're trying to to sort of, you know, it's more of a Lord of the Rings. There's a big evil threat that this group of heroes needs to deal with. Um, and like I said, I think it's good. I'm not I'm not mocking it, hmm. but it is not as unique to yeah. the setting as uh, the Thorn books are. I, I think that's very common. I, again, like if you look at fantastic works like Babylon Five, or um, you know, even Battlestar oh, Galactica, yeah. the the current, the last iteration, like even th there's some shakeups that happen after like the pilot honeymoon phase where you're mm -hmm. kind of like, okay, you're figuring out what works, what doesn't. You're finding and discovering and uh, themes, and you're you're shaking things up a little bit, and and I think. That's actually a really promising thing. Like, I, I think that, I guess it's possible for something to just come straight out of the gate and be like perfect, the, the moment, like a, a series of things to be perfect. But I kind of want to see some sort of growth and change because to me that shows right. that like the, the creator is like really reflecting upon what they're trying to say and, and what they want it oh, to sure. be. And, and there are things I can concretely point to in Eberron just like that which is like, to me in particular, one of them is the religion, the blood of Val. And from the start, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted it to be, but it didn't really come out that way. And the whole point is the blood of Val is, re is a religion that deals with necromancy. Um, and what we wanted was to say that they are grim, but not evil. Hmm. And that this is sort of taking the, the group of people who you would think, oh, they're the evil necromancers and say, oh, but they're not. And that the, the principle of the blood of Val is so they are taking the question, what just God would allow death and suffering, and saying none. Therefore, if the gods exist, they are against us. They mm -hmm. want us to suffer. And that we were made mortal to try and prevent us from rising up and becoming the equal of the gods. And uh, that therefore, our existence is a fight against death. Like death is something we should not suffer. And the them bracing on necromancy is not evil. It is they're basically spitting in the eye of the world that wants to kill them. Mm. And and the point is all along saying, again, they were supposed to be a very sort of bleak, grim, stoic mm. sort of faith, but not evil. And that comes back to, to Eberron saying the good and evil aren't as, aren't as clear cut. And that, as I said, was a point where that was the idea from the start, but they, they are pretty presented a little too much as we're mm. the evil necromancers in the very beginning and it took to fourth edition to really sort of get across that no they're they've got a whole thing you know they're actually very interesting uh you know in their own their own way this reminds me just to sort of dovetail into games um mm -hmm. i don't know what your experience is but my experience running my games is that Every time I introduce a new NPC and ever a new organization or whatever it happens to be, it's just as you said, it's never quite exactly what I wanted. And I find that it takes me two, three, four sessions or episodes in order to really figure out exactly how I want 
the the organization to behave or or what their motivations are. Um, I may have thought I knew their motivations, but those cool things that my players have brought out or have suggested or hinted at or that I'm stealing and they don't even know it, they just think I'm sort of making it up, are actually there right, in right. the background and I'm tweaking them. So I feel in a weird way like it, it's like the game sort of exists in the moment and those past games are all kind of retconned sometimes because there's sometimes when my players don't remember yep. it doesn't make any sense for my character this character to say this in this game but they don't remember three right. games ago when it said something totally different so i'll just ignore that and we're kind of building it as we go and it's a moment that we all kind of kind of share i think in time um what do you think makes a good setting then for you uh you know, the, um, the, to me, I think part of it is, again, uh, does it resonate? You know, do I, does it feel real? Um, so this is part of what I was saying with, uh, with Eberron is it's not real, but there's elements of it that connect. Mm. And this is the question to me of, of what makes me, you know, you know, one of the, the basic issues is, I always say when people are making a new world, is why are you making a new world? Why are you not just telling this story in our world? You know, you can say this is Rome, but there's dragons. And if you say this is Rome, but there are dragons, everyone knows what Rome is. Mm. Like, I don't have to explain everything to you. You've got the basics. And so my question is, if you're throwing away the foundation of all the familiarity people have with basing something in our world, what is it that, what is the story you can't tell mm. in any point in our history? Mm. What is the story that you need to make a new world for? Mm. And um, Phoenix Down Command, we made a world. And, and part of the thing is I wasn't originally planning to make a role-playing game. I was originally planning just to make an interesting setting. And I was working with a friend and he said, what if death was how your character leveled up? And that, that, you know, basically the premise of Phoenix is you're someone who's died, returned to life, and viewed with supernatural power. Every time you die, you come back stronger, but you can only come back seven times. Mm. And the point is to say this is a game in which Gandalf on the Bridge of Moriah, that's a valid way to solve a problem. And it might be the only way to solve a problem. And the immediate thing there was once we said that, I said, oh, shit, the thing about that is we need a setting where it is you're going to have to lay down your life multiple times and it's going to feel worth it. So we had to create, you know, we created this world that is beset by this thing called the dread, which is just a wave of supernatural threats on all sides. And it is the point of we had to say that there is a mystery, that there is a threat, but it feels like there are problems that A, only we can face and B, that it's worth it taking the ball right down on the bridge, mm -hmm. you know, and that this is worth doing. And so, like I say, that's a story people have said, can I play Phoenix and Ebron? And the thing to me is me mechanically you can, but Ebron is not designed to tell the story that Phoenix thrives on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that is my question is what is the story with your setting that I can't tell you know, anywhere else? And as I said with Eberron, part of the point in making it was what are the stories you can tell in Eberron that you can't tell in Forgotten Realms? Why do people need a new setting? Mm. Um, so that's always the point to me is just what is it? What is the thing I can do in your setting that I couldn't do, mm. whether it's in Rome, whether it's in Eberron, whether it's in Eldia? So you mentioned Phoenix Dawn Command. And I want to get to that in just a moment, but just to, not to sort of jump the gun too quickly, because I, I do want to get back to that. At a certain point, you you decided to start, so with your co-founder, Jennifer Ellis, um, two, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if I'm going to say this right, together? Together or together, studios, yes. Together uh, or it's together? Two, it, well, it's together, but it's T-W-O, okay. and right. uh, just a hint for all of you starting your own companies, don't do that. Don't make a name, but you have to tell people there's a W. Oh. You it. It's a bad idea. Okay. So anyhow, yes, it is together studios me, with a W. Let me write that um, down. Don't make yep. weird to spell. Yeah, I, don't, it's too late for me. Don't, I, no, already... it, it, it feels clever, but it's it's not smart. Anyhow, carry on. Anyway, 
Well, you could have. You could maybe you could make it just a two, and then get no. Yeah, we know. could do that. We could do that. That would be better. I kind of know what Anyhow. you mean, but anyway, what was it that prompted the two of you to go off and and co-found uh, together studios? Um, like, so you, I assume you'd kind of been freelancing up until then, the bulk of your work. Um, and mm-hmm. then you decided to shift into something because the idea of starting a company to me means a tremendous shift yeah. in like your daily, like workload, like you're not necessarily mm-hmm. creating You're you're going to decide to do a lot of that kind of, uh, the management side, I guess yourself and, and all of that, in addition to just the creation, was there something that prompted it or but that's why, that's why we did it. And that's why I never done it before is because I don't want to do the management side. I don't want to do production. But Jen comes from a tech background, and she is a product manager. That is what she does. Mm. And so that was the point, is it was never something that I could have done on my own. But that side of things is what she is good at. Mm. And so it was, this is something where we are literally bringing our strengths together and getting to make something that, you know, work on a creative project together instead of doing our things in our separate corners. Mm. So so basically it's exactly because she had those strengths, which, which and this is the thing I tell people is, is uh, when people say, should I make, you know, because with Kickstarter, with crowdfunding, you know, of all sorts, there's a lot more opportunity to self-publish now. But the thing you have to say is, do you want to be a publisher? Mm. Because exactly as you have said, there is a lot of work that goes into it that's not designing games, which is what I like doing. Um, but in this case, it was because my partner specifically does want to do that work. That's right. that's a skill set that she has. So it was sort of a fortuitous yeah. uh, pairing. Yeah, that's like really perfect because when you can get like a good complementary team, that that is just right. as equally passionate and not just sort of doing and one because there's no one else to do it. I I work well with words. Jen is a much more visual person than, than I do. So the the graphic design of together products, which I think are excellent, it is. Uh, you know, are. that's her. That's her her side of things. And so it really is. It's because we are both bringing entirely different sort of skill sets and interests that. That's why we started it, and that's why it works. So when you when you both started it, uh, and I can I'm just gonna assume this without even like asking, but I assume mm-hmm. that you would take all of the knowledge that you have of of the industry, the hobby, the way the system works, the way things are designed, the cre- creative aspects, and you're gonna say, you know what, I want to, we want to do them our way. Was was there some sort of kind of like felt like theme that you went into it saying, you know what, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this because this is the right way of doing it or. Well, I mean, we knew that we wanted to make uh, things that that were driven by story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and part of the point is, again, one of the things we didn't do was make D&D stuff. You know, we made Phoenix instead. Mm-hmm. And Phoenix is a game that was very much driven from the start as we wanted it to be. Uh, a lighter system and more player driven. Um, the it uses cards instead of dice, and one of the reasons it does that is because it gives the player more narrative control. You aren't going to always be able to do what you want to do based on the cards in your hand, but you know what you have in your hand, and so instead of trying to do something and failing, it is usually a matter of saying, "I can't do what I want. What can I do instead?" Mm-hmm. And uh, in Phoenix, there is also a mechanic where you can basically burn your life force to succeed at something. So you can buy success if it's worth it, but you can keep yourself doing that. So do you want to? But basically, it's taking out the random element of dice as a way to say, ultimately, success. And one of the things that's interesting in Phoenix is, again, rather than a monster rolling to hit you and me telling you the orc hits you for 15 points of damage... I will tell attack with a value of 20. Do you defend? And it is up to the player. Do they play cards they would need to avoid it or not, or to at least mm-hmm. lessen the damage? Mm-hmm. And Phoenix is a game where you may very well say, I could avoid this attack, but I'm not going to because I don't think it will kill me. And I am going to, I want to save my, my power to make an attack on my turn. 
it's more important to me to be able to take a dramatic action on my turn than it is to avoid this attack. Mm. That's a choice you don't make in D&D. The monster mm. just hits you or it doesn't hit you. You know, I mean, reactions come in. Yeah, you, this, you've, yeah, as a general a rule, that's not the kind of thing. Mm. What, what was it then? Um, and oh. please no, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and I mean, so that, that principle then sort of ties to other things we have done, like the adventure zone, uh, like action cats, where again, we like things that inspire story in people. I, I noticed, um, and I really love this because I have only seen this. Well, I've only played a few game, a few RPGs this way there, there, your games, I was kind of surprised they're, I mean, a tremendous, they use cards rather than dice, which I think is mm -hmm. awesome. Like some of them are, mm -hmm. I guess, card games and others, like you said, they're uh, an RPG that uses cards. Um, was that a choice on your part? Did you say, you know what? I've been doing, I've been slinging dice for decades. I want to do cards. Or was it something that just sort of came out of your, your interest in telling the narrative over say, it's more that, and, and it's exactly that, is that it's not that I have anything against dice. It's that it is a different, it is that different effect of randomization. Of cards are random in the sense of, of what you get, but then you choose what to do with the cards of your, in your hand. It's resource management as opposed to dice, which are completely, you know, with Phoenix, what we said is what we were trying to avoid is where you have that moment where you're facing the big the big final bad guy, mm. make your big kill my father speech, you use your fourth level smite, and then you roll a one. And that is funny, but it is not the moment I saw. In, and what we like in Phoenix is right. you've got those choices. Of, you've got the cards to do it. You don't have the cards to do it, so wait around. But at least you don't get that, that frustration of doing the thing that I thought was going to go one way and it totally doesn't. Mm. Or if it's worth it to you, you can do it anyway, but you might die doing it, you know, if, but Phoenix is the game where if that's, if it's worth it, do that. Um, Phoenix is a game where usually about half the party dies in any given session, but nine times out of 10, when you die in Phoenix, it's because you're doing something awesome. Right. You know? And can you, so. can you tell us a little bit about Phoenix Dawn Command? You've, you've mentioned it so many times, and I sort of get the feeling mm -hmm. like you're really excited about it. Can you tell us a little bit about like its origins, where it came from, and, and how you developed it? Well, it literally is what I said, is that a friend of mine and I were working on an idea for just a random sort of fantasy setting. He said, what if you had a, a game in which death was how you you know you got stronger and it was because of a, an exalted campaign actually oh. where that we were in i had to leave the group it was a really strong fantastic campaign but i was moving away and so we decided instead of trying to play remotely we'd have a cool dramatic scene where you know my character basically uh sacrifice themselves to take out one of the big villains in the setting. And it was this amazing moment where we were just like, okay, but what if we could have that all the time? Yeah. And, you know, basically what if you took what is usually the worst thing that happens in a role-playing game, mm. dying, and combined it with the best thing, leveling up, and said, oh, let's put these, you know, these together. So, uh, so Phoenix, first off, that's why we put cards instead of dice, because the point is it is more in the player's control. You decide, am I going to try and defend? Is it more important to me to stay alive, you know, to, to protect myself? Or is it more important to me to take this guy down on my next attack uh, mm -hmm. by using the cards? Mm -hmm. You have a pool of what's called sparks, which are the energy you use to power magical abilities. But you can also add them directly to the result of a spread. So again, like I said, you can buy success mm -hmm. when you run out of spy. And so you basically have sparks and health. Health is your hit points, you know, so you can be killed by physical damage. And that's something that can just happen if, you know, a big attack comes. Sparks, you die when you run out of spark, but you're the one who chooses to use them. And the other part I didn't mention is if you die from physical damage, if I just get, a, you know, a stone dropped on my head, um, if I still have sparks, I can actually essentially ride along. My spirit can sort of possess one of the other players. And so I can sort of join with them. And even though my body is lost, I'm still active in the scenario. And so it's not until you use all your sparks that you're, you're, so to speak, out for the night. And because that's voluntary, 
it doesn't happen unless you choose for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said the point about the world of Phoenix mm -hmm. is it had to be set up from the start that you're going to every adventure feel like this is a moment in which it's worth it for me to lay down my life to protect these people, to protect this group, to accomplish this task. Mm -hmm. And that's a very different vibe from just we're going into this dungeon to find a lot of treasure. Mm -hmm. You know, it needs to be something where it feels like, no, we have a mission that matters. Mm -hmm. One of the things I use as a simple example is you're dropped in a village and uh, there's a zombie outbreak and you have two hours to contain it. And if you can deal with it in two hours, it doesn't matter how many of you die doing it because you will come back. And in fact, you'll be stronger if you all die, because in Phoenix, you don't come back right away and you don't come back where you died. It's very much the Gandalf situation. He does come back stronger, but it takes a while. And so in this situation, the point is, as long as you succeed in the mission, doesn't matter if you end up even with a TPK. On the other hand, if you all die without completing the mission, by the time you come back, it will be too late. We won't be able to contain it, and we're going to have lost that region. But the story isn't over. So now you will have to deal with the consequences of that failure. You know, like failure is on the table in a way that it usually isn't in a lot of role-playing games, because if you all die, the story's over. Mm -hmm. So we don't really want that to happen. I think part of what's cool about it is we can say, no, you could fail this mission. Like, and then the story's not going to end. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with the consequences of that. You know, so it's just engage with both. Yep. I was going to say, ahead. what's interesting about this is as you describe it, I started thinking of how it actually reminds me, even though I know you're you're creating something different, the philosophy behind it and maybe the thrust behind it reminds me so much of Eberron, where we were just talking a few minutes mm -hmm. ago about how in Eberron, when you're creating your character, you have to think about what's happened before and how that impacts and how your character kind of fits into the now based on, okay, if you're a fighter, uh, but you weren't in the war, well, then why are you mm -hmm. a fighter and what were, what is going on and what's happening? So right. where, whereas in Phoenix Dawn Command, you know, your character, you played those moments and then your character, there's a, I assume there's a bit of a pause or a break and then they sort of come back. And now mm -hmm. you've got to think about the repercussions of what happened before. Well, and there's more because you gain power when you, you basically level. But mm -hmm. the essentially your class, what's called school in Phoenix, is based on why you died and the lesson you took away from it. So essentially, and, wow. and in character creation, the whole point of character creation is you are someone who has died and come back as a Phoenix. So what we say is, how did you die? What is the language and what brought you back? And so you have the Durant school who died because they weren't strong enough or tough enough. And so they become stronger and they are the fighter. They are the durable character who can protect others. Uh, the devoted die for others. They sacrifice their lives to protect others. And they're the support character, sort of like the cleric. The shrouded die for knowledge or, or because of a secret they didn't know. Uh, forceful wasn't fast enough. Um, and the elemental dies for duty, and then finally the bitter dies as a failure. And so part of the point is when you die, one of the things that the DM and the player stop to say is, what kind of death was this? Why did you die? What is the lesson you are taking away from it? You know, do you feel you died because you weren't strong enough, so you're coming back durant, or do you just feel that was a failure, in which case you're coming back bitter? And so by the time you're on your third or fourth life, because those literally sort of affect the mm. abilities you have, by the time you're on your fourth or fifth life, your abilities really reflect the sacrifices you made and the lessons that you learned from. Mm. So it's just a very different experience from yeah. that, oh, I'm just a fifth level fighter because I'm a fifth level fighter and I yeah. killed a lot of goblins. Right. You know? you, you've actually earned them through through decisions that you've made in your past, and that's how you've gained and and advanced or moved or matured or grown as as a character um i was going to ask this question in a very simple way uh originally when i wrote the question so i send my questions ahead of time to to my guests just so mm -hmm. that they you know they know what's going on i was going to ask it very very simply and i was going to say what do you think that eberron says about you but now having having 
listen to sort of like your approach and your style and the types of games, other games that you've done, what do you think, not to put you on your spot, what do you think your games say about you as a person? I, I feel a little bit like there's some threads here that I'm sort of picking up on. They're kind of tenuous in my head. I don't really, you know yourself obviously better than I do. What do you think they say about my thing? I mean, I will say one of my other games, of course, is Gloom, which is a game where uh, you have a family of people and you want them to suffer miserably and die. And I've said before that Phoenix is kind of halfway between uh, Eberron and Gloom uh, because it is a fantasy adventure, and yet also it's a story where ultimately you want your character to die. Um, and But what I'll say, a big part of all of those is one of the things that makes Gloom compelling is the players tell stories as they do it. You explain how these terrible things happen. And Phoenix, again, puts a lot of narrative power in the player's hands. And going back to Eberron, what I'll say is part of the point of Eberron with the more aspect is I want players to have to make interesting decisions. Mm. I love players having to think about something, having the answers not be easy. And that's the point of the Shades of Grey of Eberron, that mm. sometimes killing the bad guy isn't the right choice. Sometimes... There isn't a clear bad guy. And as I say, I like it. It's what I said at the very beginning. I like the fact that we create something together that isn't what everyone else will experience. And that's the point of that game I ran 60 times. It's always different because the answers aren't clear cut. It's not that everyone will obviously always do this one thing. And so I like those things where I can feel I'll run this again and I want to see if people make, you know, what, how will this group address this problem? And so I think the biggest thing to me is as both a game master and a game creator, I want, want everyone at the table engaged. I want everyone making their own story and taking some part of it. The game master may take the lion's share of sort of guiding that and, you know, uh, supporting that. But ultimately I want everybody, you know, engaging their own creativity. Mm. Um, there's no easy way to ask this question, but I've been asking it of, of several of my guests and a, a few of the last few guests that I've had. Uh, I think it, it kind of affects you in, in a much deeper way here. I was just wondering what you thought in general. So Eberron, of course, is at Wizards. And I know that, uh, I, I feel like what's really interesting is I feel like you're creating official stuff and mm -hmm. unofficial stuff at the same time, which is so interesting. It reminds mm -hmm. me of like a Sean Connery, Roger Moore, uh, you know, Albert Broccoli we produced Bond films versus Never Say Never Again, directed by Irvin Kirshner. Like, I feel like there's a little bit of this really interesting kind of thing going on, but it's it's all happening in the same person. How how do you think if you're creating stuff officially and unofficially on on both sides of it, um, have you felt the effects of the uh, the recent OGL news at all? Has that made you you know think one thing or think another thing, or does it, you just sort of shrug and say, "Ah, I sold Not it for particularly." I, I'd say I sold it for one hundred twenty grand. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. point to me is the OGL doesn't affect me because. Uh, I have to, the only way to create Eberron material is through the DMs Guild. And the deal with the DMs Guild is much more restrictive and uh -huh. um, limiting than the OGL ever was. Mm -hmm. And, right. you know, people complain about, oh, you know, Wizards is going to ask for money. The, the, the DMs Guild, you give up 50% of, uh, right. you know, the profit. Um, and so to a certain degree, to me, the OGL was serious and concerning from just a general perspective and as someone who who does things yet at the same time in my immediate work is utterly inconsequential because the work i create is already so much more limited mm. um i will say that my my feeling on the ogl was that they were more concerned about companies like disney or facebook making stuff and that they didn't originally intend the goal wasn't let's stomp on the guy who's making 500 copies of a book on the, right. you know, whatever. Um, but the point that they weren't thinking about that guy is still significant. Yeah. You know, that doesn't uh, just because they weren't considering the consequences of their actions doesn't somehow make it better. Right. If that makes any sense. That's. Um, oh, but again, for me personally, it was not, it was not a, a something that had an immediate impact.
You know, it's really interesting that you say that. And I maybe I just to be honest, I turned off a lot of the news because there was so much like stuff and it was it blew up so mm-hmm. much. And I prefer to just sort of stay on the positive side. I don't want to be ignorant, but I, I like to stay on the it's positive too- side and not dwell on all the negative. But actually what you mm-hmm. just said about like Disney Facebook. I hadn't really thought about that. Like, I guess, is that true? I guess, like, a company like Disney could come in and they could stomp on with billions of dollars. This is the thing. By the terms of the OGL, anybody could do anything they wanted under these terms and Mm. Wizards gets nothing. And the point is, they don't care about a guy who makes 100 copies of a book on Durgar. But by the terms of it, Disney could say, we're making... You know, Mickey Mouse D and D essentially, and sell a hundred thousand copies of the book, and Wizards would get nothing. And they could sell a hundred thousand copies of that book. And the thing to me was was Hasbro saying, "We're about to put out this D and D movie. We're going to try and make D and D a bigger brand. We don't want." A, and that's why the deal. The deal was saying if you make more than seven hundred and fifty thousand right. dollars yes. on D and D products, you have to give us stuff. No one on the I'm one of the best selling authors in the DMs Guild, and I'm not anywhere close to that. Mm-hmm. They're talking about things like Critical Role and even Critical Role. I think they were making deals with, but they were concerned about things like Disney, like Facebook, like you know major players who, under the terms of things, right, could use the OGL. Um, and again, as I said, the point is they were not doing this to try and get those yeah. of us who were writing little things in our basement. But again, that doesn't change the fact that just because you stepped on it yeah. doesn't mean that somehow it's great for the ant. It's you know. It's, so I mean, I'm not trying to no to I, dismiss it. I I, but I think I'm, it wasn't intended. I'm kind of with you on that. Like I feel like it's it's interesting. Like I feel like there's two things going on here. I think, like you said. Most of the people. So I remember when I was in film school, I had uh, I, I had this this teacher from uh, from uh, uh, from Hungary, who who like famous I suppose like famous like filmmaker Kazmierski, and I said to him, you know what I I want to adapt the Stephen King novel, or the Stephen King short story, but I'm worried about Stephen King like coming after me. And he and Kazmierski looked at me. He's like, "Do you really think Stephen King is going to come down out of the heavens and and grab you for your cheap eight millimeter thing that's shown right. to seven people on a on a Saturday right. night at a movie theater where the alarm the 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 fire alarm is going right. off? Oh, do you think he's going to come in here? You you pee on. He doesn't even know you exist. And of course, and, and of course you do because it's important to you." But this yes. is the thing, is that the entire community that is upset about this, Wizards is concerned about, again, hundreds of guys. thousands of people playing, uh, not the, you know, whereas the best-selling things on the, the um, you know, on the DM scale, if you sell a thousand copies, you're doing well. Mm. And again, that is so not on their radar. Right. Um, and again, that doesn't make it better for us. Yes. You know, well, that I'm was... not saying we shouldn't be concerned. That was, but I'm just saying it's not a conspiracy that they were – that right. wasn't their goal. Well, that's kind of know? the second part of my question. It, I feel a little bit like what you're saying seems so obvious. Like it seems so obvious like if I am Wizards or whatever and I, I'm sitting there, I'm going to go, okay, I'm really worried about Disney and, and Microsoft and, and like whoever – Making right. these huge games and releasing them. Halo 5e. Right, like Halo 5e Microsoft. or whatever. You know what I mean? Why, why would they have kind of, like, I don't want to say bungled the rollout, but why wouldn't they have softened it somehow or said, yeah, this really doesn't affect anyone or, like... I mean, again, I, I can't say. I don't work for Wizards. I don't know what they do. The main thing is... I worked in the video game industry. Hmm. And this is what I'm saying is big companies operate on a very different level from small companies. Hmm. And I think, again, the, you know, the people who were at the high level weren't thinking about the impact on the small level. Hmm. You know, again, you're not thinking about the ant when you step on them. Right. You're thinking about the other human, you know, who right. you see as a threat. 
Yeah. Well, um, I, I think that's I don't what... know. I mean, I'm not, again, this is not something I in right. any way claim to be any kind of expert. This is just my thing is, is from my work in the video game industry mm. before I ever got into this industry. My point is, yeah, big companies are going to, big companies are there to make money. That is what they are there for. They are not there to try and take care of a tiny percentage of their audience. And the fact that we're like, we're shocked that, you know, they are not doing a thing for our personal benefit should not be particularly surprising. Right. It's nice when they do do something yeah. for our benefit, but they're looking at millions of customers, not the the sort of 20,000 most engaged, most energized, hmm. even though for us, we feel like they should it be feels like because it, yeah. we're so passionate and we care so much. But uh, but that's not – we're not really, you know, the big thing on their radar. Yeah. It's really interesting that you said that. that's just like – I can't believe that I haven't read that or heard that or seen that anywhere, but it just seems so obvious. Like I hadn't even thought about – Could like, be totally wrong. Again, I'm not no, going to be but an expert. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean some big publisher decides, hey, I'm going to release a 5e version and it's going to be, you know, I'm going to put – like you said, Halo, Halo 5e would like, I can't imagine that and not crushing. remember, what you're talking about is Hasbro, not Wizards of the Coast. And it's a right. Hasbro executive saying to someone, wait a second, Microsoft could put out a Halo 5e game and we would get nothing. Yeah. And being incredulous about that. So they try and put this thing out, which we all rightfully say, wait a second, you are screwing us over. You're taking away this thing, which again, when it was made, yeah. it wasn't Hasbro. It was a small company. They right. were engaged with the guy making the game yes. in his garage, but they're not now. And and so that's my point is we are mad because they were going to take something away that was given to us in a different time with a different right. intent. But we're, they're not the same. It's not the yeah. same people. And it is the same people. I'm like, Chris Perkins is still there, but he's not. You know, it's Hasbro making those yeah. big decisions. It's yeah. a different company I think... than the company that made the OGL. And they are operating in a whole different realm, realm, you know, with different concerns. Um, and as I said, I think didn't even really think of the the impact that it was going to have. That is a super. But again, this take. is so much complete speculation. No, I don't know anything. I'm, there you go. I'm going to say what Keith Baker has just said. I'm going to take it as back. I th I think that's really smart. Like I hadn't even thought about that, and I I really really see that. And I can see that as a Hasbro exec getting really nervous about something like that happening. But. So, so that's the main thing to me is what I say to try and calm people down is, again, mm. it sucked. It was terrible. But my point is what I don't feel is that, that it was intentionally malicious yeah. any more than me stepping on an ant. Right. It was just completely we were not the thing they were worried about, you well, know, and doesn't change the, the harm. But yeah. it's not like an evil conspiracy out to get the guy in his garage that's not the the, the nature of the beast is what i'm saying so games have got people so passionately engaged these days role-playing has kind of exploded and and things have just like really they're really taking off um what sort of impact uh, and i know you only have like a few minutes left and i'm gonna i'm gonna let you go it's here true. in a minute um what do you hope that people are gonna get out of your games when they play, when someone picks up a Keith Baker game, mm -hmm. um, sure. uh, whatever it be, what do you mm -hmm. hope that they get out of one of your games? I think I've said the two the two key things to me, which are I hope that it will challenge people to make interesting decisions, and I hope that it will encourage people to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. And in the case of a game like Illumat, which is totally different, that's just a, a card game. But with Illumat, we want you to feel like you're part of a story. It is still something that we've tried to make evocative, mm -hmm. even though it is not a storytelling game. Mm -hmm. um, with any of my other games, The Adventure Zone, Gloom, even mm -hmm. Acting Cats, I hope that, like I said, either it will try and encourage you to make a story and to be creative, uh, or at least to be making interesting decisions and having an interesting time. Well, Keith Baker, I've kept you for too long. Thank you very much for for uh, coming on the program. I, I really do appreciate it. 
uh, I, Absolutely. I am a great admirer of, of your work and, and your accomplishments and talking to you like has really, uh, like helped me understand a few more pieces of this, this incredible role-playing game scene. So thank you for that. Um, for those of you watching at home, thank you very much for, for following along with us. If you're interested in, uh, helping us out, uh, please do think about, liking and subscribing you can find us on twitter on facebook uh but of course you can always find us right here on youtube just by hitting that subscribe button and i highly recommend and of course you must have but if you haven't checked out keith's work and you haven't taken a look at uh together games um i apologize because i was rushing around before i haven't put the links in the below yep. but in the next like hour or so i'm going to update it with links to all of keith's stuff uh, I highly encourage you to go check all of that stuff out. Um, it's it's well worth the investment. And I think just from listening to him tonight, uh, if if one or two of the games he's mentioned haven't gotten you intrigued, I don't I don't know. Maybe you're just uh, mm -hmm. you're you're not you're not watching. You're not listening. Mm -hmm. um, so to all of you out there, thank you very much for for watching. Uh, everybody out there, have a great game and and stay safe. <laughs>